everybody. Um, first of all, this is uh, such a pleasure to have this this annual Charles Brower lecture. Just want to thank Charlie, you know, our former president, for this has been so important to the society over time, um, for working with us to make this happen. Um, second, if you're not a member of the society, I hope that this annual meeting will inspire you to become one. Um, and now just for the history of the lecture, this is the 12th year um, this lecture has been done. It goes back just to read briefly the previous lectures, um, esteemed lectures, Johnny Vidir, Sundaresh Menon, Professor Michael Reichman, Gabriel Kaufman Kohler, David Karen, Meg Kinnear, Judge Peter Tomkus, or Daniel Bethlehem, J Lucy uh, Reed, Judith Gill, and then last year, Sir Christopher Greenwood. <laughs> Rosemary, I mean, Rosemary, you know, until last night, you were in it with Justice Rosie Abella. It was the second time I've cried after an address. The first time, of course, was with you, such a powerful address. And of course, it's, it goes without saying that, you know, having someone who experienced being a refugee coming and then rising to be a great judge um, is, you know, just such a remarkable story. And you have such a remarkable story. So we are so, you know, honored to have you with us. Let me say just a little bit about just the, the, the judicial career that you've had, which is it began in 1979, but this is amazing. Florida governors appointed her as a state trial court judge, later elevating her in 1984 to the state's immediate appellate court before ultimately appointing her to the Florida Supreme Court, making her, and this is horrible to be able to say, but the first woman <laughs> justice in the Florida Supreme Court's history, right? And we all know what that represents. And and again, last night with Justice, justice Rosie Abella being a first in so many in Canada, I mean, we've become a much better society. We have a lot further to go. But Rosemary Burkett represents so many firsts for us. In 1992, her colleague elected her as Florida's first woman chief justice. Justice Barquette then served for two decades as judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, to which she was nominated by President William Clinton. Since October 2013, she has served as a judge on the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal in The Hague. Judge Barquette is no stranger to the society. In 2016, she was elected as our honorary president. Um, and in 2017, she was the recipient of Willig's Prominent Woman in International Law Award. In 2015, President Barack Obama appointed Judge Barquette to the panel of conciliators for the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. She has received many honors and awards for judicial work, including having been named the National Association of Women Judges Honoree of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Rosemary. Thank you very much, Greg. I'm not going to hug you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, I've been told the story that Winston Churchill was asked to give a speech once to a very prestigious group, like this one. Um, he approached the lectern, and with his famous cigar in hand, he looked at the audience and he said, never give up. Um, he paused, and the audience waited, and he repeated, never give up, and he paused again. Now the audience was leaning forward to hear the rest, and once more, he said, never give up. And then he left the stage and left the building. I have been tempted several times to give that speech, sans the cigar, of course, including today. It is a bit daunting to consider, first, that it is in honor of my friend Charlie Brower Mr. Arbitrator, so I surely want to do well. And second, it is in front of an audience of arbitration and international law experts who hold very strong views about their corner of the legal landscape. Charlie Brower has been called, and I quote, a repository of expertise on arbitral proceedings and on substantive law. I have personally observed this expertise in conferences in our tribunal, watching him call up from memory case after case to respond to a point. His career has mirrored the growth of arbitration since the 80s, and he has been instrumental in shaping much of that growth. As all of those who know him know, he is an amazing human being. My own career path deferred my full participation in international law and arbitration while I served 
on different conflict resolution mechanisms in the judicial system of the United States. I have been extraordinarily lucky to observe various conflict resolution entities, both from the outside looking in and sometimes from the inside looking, well, just inside. As I have served, as you have heard, as a trial and appellate judge in both state and federal courts, and on the international tribunal on which I presently serve, as well as a judge ad hoc on the ICJ and an arbitrator in private cases, I'm constantly asked what differences I find between all these various institutions that attempt to resolve disputes. Well, on a very superficial level, Federal courts generally are more informal and more fun than the formality of international courts and arbitrations. And state courts in the United States are even more informal and can be even more amusing than federal courts. Take, for example, the response to an opinion I drafted and signed on behalf of the Florida Supreme Court, disbarring a lawyer who had competency issues on many levels. After his disbarment, he sued all of us members of the Florida Supreme Court and federal court. Enlisting the judge defendants in the caption of the complaint, he gave the full names of every male justice and then added, and that bimbo Barquette. <laughs> uh, a side incident to that caption was the visit of my colleague on the court, Ray Ehrlich, a wonderful, wonderful older Southern gentleman who walked into my office with the complaint in hand and wanted to know what a bimbo was. <laughs> a gentler letter was the one telling me that the writer disagreed with an opinion of mine in these words. You have slipped off the path, in time you will return, and then in bold capital letters the admonition, please hurry. The most amusing incidents happen in state trial courts. For example, when a 65-year-old wife was testifying against her husband in a divorce case, she was handed a letter by her husband's lawyer and confrontingly asked if the letter, which she had written, did not contradict her entire testimony. She took the letter, looked through it, and then to everyone's horror and amazement, tore it up on the stand, tossed the pieces back to the lawyer and asked, what letter? <laughs> or the prospective juror in a pornography case who was being questioned to determine if he could be a fair juror in such a case. The defendant's lawyer asked him if pornography bothered him, to which he replied in a very puzzled voice, yes, of course, isn't it supposed to? There are many more stories like this and a very funny exchanges during appellate oral arguments, but I have not yet been able to add to my collection of quirky court stories since joining the international scene. Although at the break, perhaps some of you can add to my funny stories collection. But to turn a bit serious, <clears throat> you were supposed to be softened up by this point. One of the beauties of living a long life is the constancy of discovery, not only of completely new things, but also the unfolding of new layers within areas you think you know something about. That's how I have felt experiencing different ways of dispute resolution. Of course, we all know the universal principle animating all dispute resolution mechanisms is the recognition that human interaction will always lead to differences or disputes and that any ordered society must provide some mechanism to resolve these disputes. Indispensable components of such mechanisms, as we also know, if they are to be accepted as legitimate, are the need for the process to be fair and the dispenser of justice to be independent. Now, we've heard the phrase fair process and independent decision makers so often, they roll off our tongues with such ease that we are enticed to sometimes believe that these are static concepts that have been already achieved. But human nature being what it is, concepts of fairness and independence should be continually examined, I believe, and hopefully can always be improved upon. 
As it relates to process first, <clears throat> I will confess to starting out a little like Professor Henry Higgins. Here I have to digress from the flow of these remarks to actually include an oral footnote. When I was reviewing my remarks with my young legal advisor, she stopped me saying, I'm not familiar with Professor Higgins's work. <laughs> so I feel it necessary to educate the young people in one eighth of the room who have never seen or heard the wonderful soundtrack of the classic musical, My Fair Lady. For those too young to know, and those too old to remember, Henry Higgins was the curmudgeonly misogynist who sings, why can't a woman be more like a man? Men are so honest, so thoroughly square, eternally noble, historically fair. Why do they do everything their mothers do? Why don't they grow up, well, like their father instead? I refer you to YouTube for the rest. But to go back to process, I am confessing to feeling a little bit like Henry Higgins, wondering why international dispute resolution couldn't be a bit more, well, like us, the judicial systems from which I came. Why, instead of briefs going on for ages, can we not have limits on their pages? I cannot take credit for that rhyme, but I'm not sure that my source wants attribution. <laughs> but seriously, what is so wrong with page limitations as US rules require instead of having to slog through repetitive, rambling 200 or 400 page briefs or even 800 page briefs? I would be thrown out of my book club if I recommended an 800 page book. Why should international dispute resolution mechanisms not require, as does the US Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, that an attorney sign his or her initial pleading affirming that the attorney has made a reasonable inquiry into the facts and law he or she asserts, verifying that there is a legitimate legal basis for the suit and the submission has been made in good faith? Or why should severe sanctions not be imposed when clearly false or fraudulent evidence has been submitted? Surely for an adjudicatory process to be considered fair and legitimate, it cannot countenance the presentation of false information, whether in written or testamentary form, and simply calling out the conduct but imposing no sanctions is not enough. As noted by the United States Supreme Court, tampering with the administration of justice through fraud involves much more than an injury to a single litigant. It is a wrong against the very institution set up to protect and safeguard the public. The fairness of any adjudicatory system is entirely reliant on the integrity of its actors. And while maintaining the integrity of proceedings requires the combined efforts of all participants, it is perhaps most heavily influenced by the actions of counsel, who must serve, in my opinion, to some degree as gatekeepers, diligently preventing false or fraudulent or even frivolous submissions to a court or a tribunal. Whereas in the United States, codes of conduct for lawyers are comprehensive and even specifically mandated in some state court rules, I realized that international arbitration is governed by no universally accepted ethics provisions. Some arbitral institutions have none at all. Some do have what I would call aspirational codes of conduct. So like Henry Higgins, I wanted to know why everyone couldn't be like us. It of course did not take me long, with the help of people like Charlie, to focus on the fact that international means, duh, international. Many countries with different laws and different rules and different cultures and different languages. I know ethical rules for lawyers, for example, may not only vary from country to country, but may conflict with the ethical rules of the jurisdiction in which an arbitration may be seated. I get it. But having gotten it, I do think that constant reevaluation of rules, practices, and customs is necessary to see if the universal goal of fairness has been or continues to be met both domestically and internationally. 
Our rules and procedures in the United States are not perfect and could benefit from examination and improvement in light of the rules, customs, and practices of other domestic courts and of international institutions. And likewise, the international community could benefit from consideration of the rules, practices, and customs of others. Of course, I know there have been efforts to improve process. Many have advocated for standards of behavior, for improving the regulation of lawyers, and for developing a meaningful code of conduct, among other things. But I am hopeful that in every resolution, dispute resolution entity, whether judicial or arbitral, there will be even greater openness to first regularly re-examining and then to implementing better rules and practices from other jurisdictions that might make dispute resolution more efficient, less costly, and more fair. So much for comments on process. Let me turn to a few remarks about the second essential component of an ordered and just society. That is that the dispenser of justice be independent. I don't need to belabor the usual threats to an independent decision maker, and we've already discussed many times in many forms the need for judges and arbitrators to separate themselves from the party or the entity that appointed them and be willing to rule against them if the law or the facts require it. But it bears repeating because the temptation, even though it may be slight, is ongoing for all decision makers. I think it takes an effort in every case to be and remain aware that we all have biases and that our perspective as a decision maker calls for a different mindset than that of a lawyer advocate. And an interesting example is that of Justice Salmon Chase, who was Secretary of the Treasury under Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln appointed him to the Supreme Court thinking Chase, since he had been Treasury Secretary, would uphold the constitutionality of the law used to finance the Civil War. Chase, however, <clears throat> ended up writing the court's opinion, finding the law unconstitutional. The irony is that as Secretary of the Treasury, Chase himself had written the law that he now found unconstitutional. Chief Justice Rehnquist noted that the opinion was a textbook example of the proposition that one may look at a legal question differently as a judge than one did as a member of the executive branch. The very best example, however, may be Judge James Horton of Alabama presiding over the trial of a black man accused of rape in 1933. He had the courage in that place and that time to conclude that the conviction could not stand in the absence of sufficient evidence. When told he would never be reelected if he overturned the conviction, his only response was, what does that have to do with the case? I think this is a question we as decision makers must continually oblige ourselves to answer when evaluating our reasons for any decision. What does that reason have to do with the case? The answer to this question is sometimes easy, obvious, and transparent. Other times it is neither easy nor obvious, and what is most concerning to me, not transparent enough. There has been much discussion and debate regarding the function of decision makers. Although everyone agrees that dispute resolution is their primary function, there is some disagreement about whether their role should extend to functions beyond the resolution of the dispute. Judge David Karen, my friend, who was sadly taken from us much too soon, addressed this debate when he gave the Brower Lecture a few years ago. He explored whether the decision makers should stick to the facts in the law and do or say no more, or whether they should additionally, either directly or indirectly, further a multiplicity of social functions. Judge Karen was talking about two opposing views of the judicial role, which were clearly delineated in the rationale of various decisions and judgments. I want to make a few remarks instead about those decisions or judgments that are not at all clear about any underlying rationale and the danger that I think those kinds of decisions pose to confidence in an independent judiciary or tribunal. 
A fair trial has been defined as, quote, where the court follows all procedures correctly and treats all parties equally so that the trial itself is fair and effective regardless of the decision and outcome. It is the last phrase, regardless of the decision or outcome, which gives me pause. We know that cases before international courts and tribunals reach this level of dispute resolution because they are, for many reasons, difficult. They bring not only a legal problem to the court, but also the baggage of serious political, socioeconomic, diplomatic, and practical issues. We also know that decision makers cannot divorce themselves entirely from this baggage or the broader implications that judgments may have. For better or for worse, to some extent, public policy considerations, societal norms and shifts, pressure from appointing parties, and personal biases can shape a judge's perceptions and may sometimes seep into the resolution of a case. Judges are not robots, nor do they live in a bubble. Whether these outside considerations are or are not legitimate begs the question of whether they do in fact have an impact on the decision in the first place and why. In straightforward cases where the law is clear and the facts are undisputed, there may be little room for the judge to be influenced by external factors. However, the more nuanced or unique the set of facts, the more the line between black and white begins to blur, leaving us with a spectrum of gray and the temptation, acknowledged or not, to proceed on the basis of our gut feeling or to ignore reasons and simply dictate the desired result without explanation. We certainly have the power to decide issues simply through judicial fiat rather than syllogistic reasoning, but I don't think we have the right to do so. And there are many opportunities to choose judicial fiat over logic or explanation. For example, we constantly have to grapple with the principle of construction that plain language must be applied when interpreting a statute or a treaty or a contract, but doing so may have an objectively deleterious effect on a nation or regional peace and security or an unintended effect on a party, or simply a result we do not like? Do we ignore the facts and or the law? If so, we should say so. Or while the law governing a contract may allow an infrastructure project in a developing country, an arbitrator may wish to consider the potential socioeconomic impact on the local community, or environmental sustainability, or the broader public interest, but do we know if these considerations influence their decision? And if they do, should they not say so and why? For another example, if damages are due, but the extent of the harm cannot be proven, it has become commonplace to issue awards on the basis of equitable considerations. But also commonplace is a lack of detailed or any further explanation. The process of quantifying the unquantifiable, the value of a lost limb or a loved one, for example, is, of course, extremely difficult to put into words. Does this make it acceptable to simply hold that the amount awarded has been based on equitable considerations? Should we not know what equitable considerations were considered and how exactly these affected the quantum of the award? Perhaps procedural questions or the secondary rules of state responsibility might legitimately be affected by socioeconomic concerns if a human rights approach is considered. Sometimes not. But whether that approach was considered should be made clear. It is certainly true that the question of what information is extraneous and irrelevant to a case is itself extremely layered and difficult. But I think this is all the more reason an explanation is warranted. Fair pronouncements are not enough. Any reader should always be able to determine the status and legitimacy of proffered factors motivating a decision. Judge Karen's lecture asked whether, assuming fair process, a judge should turn a blind eye to extraneous factors such as the potentially negative ramifications of his or her decision. I'm suggesting that judges have an obligation to say 
whether or not extraneous factors influence the decision and how and why. And forcing ourselves to state clearly the rationale for every conclusion guards against internal biases we may not even know or acknowledge we may have. And as an aside, forcing ourselves to explain clearly in writing inevitably leads to a better and a fairer judgment. The very effort of explaining in writing often makes it apparent whether or not one's chain of logic may or may not be flawed. Failing to be completely transparent, on the other hand, leads to the criticism of a lack of independence and undermines confidence in the process. This is the danger faced by my own Supreme Court in the United States. Professor Stephen Vladek points out in his book, The Shadow Docket, that only 1% of the Supreme Court's cases are now resolved with oral argument and written decisions signed by one or more judges after full briefing uh, with 50 page limits, by the way. The court now hears only around 60 cases a year on the merits. In contrast, since 2016, the remaining percentage of cases, almost 99%, have been decided what is officially known as the court's emergency docket. Originally intended for emergencies, cases resolved via this docket were generally few and far between. Emergency orders were intended to be rare and were supposed to be issued only when the lower court's ruling would cause irreparable harm if allowed to stand. Thus, very few requests for emergency relief were submitted through the years. When they were heard, it rarely resulted in decisions with major substantive implications. As Justice Kagan noted in a 2021 order that blocked implementation of the Clean Water Act, the order renders the court's emergency docket not for emergencies at all. The docket becomes only another place for merits determinations except made without full briefing and argument. These orders very often ef effectively decide the merits of the case, but are not subject to the high standards of procedural regularity set by its merit cases. There are no oral arguments, there are no opinions, the orders are unsigned, and there is no explanation. The concern, of course, is not unique to the United States court. For example, in a dissent in an ICSID case, Sir Frank Berman expressed the same concern, noting that the real question in the case was whether the arbitrators adequately explained what they were doing in the interpretive process. The finding, Berman stated, has to be the result of a proper fact-finding procedure, and the elements and steps in this procedure must be spelled out in the award so as to enable the claimant <coughs> not to mention other consumers of the ICSID system to understand what the tribunal has done and why. Professor William Lucy has considered that to reach a reasoned decision, the, deci the decision maker must have some reason besides intuition. Secondly, they must be able to distinguish between genuine reasons and putative ones. And thirdly, they must weigh reasons by assessing the relative weight of all genuine available reasons and must make a final decision based on the strongest and weightiest of the bunch. And this process must be transparent. Regardless of whether one falls into the camp that believes in the more restrictive judicial role, leaving policy to other entities, there can be exceptions. We are, after all, human beings and not machines, at least not yet. But we can only accept exceptions if we know and understand the reasons for them. Now, I recognize that this concept is nothing new, but we still see pronouncements with little or if any rationale. And I think these should be called out. I think it bears repeating that a lack of accountability opens the door for abuse of power or manipulation of the process to advance particular agendas or interests and that for the legal system to function properly, the public must be confident in the fairness, impartiality, and integrity of any decision maker, and that confidence can only exist with process that is as fair as we can make it and adjudications that are clearly explained and transparent. Thank you very much for letting me come and give the Brower election. Thank you, Charlie.
and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you. If there's any questions, please come up to the microphone. Oh, see, everything was perfectly clear. Nobody has any brilliant. questions. It was a brilliant lecture. Thank, well, yes. I don't know about yeah. that. Oh, no, you. it was fabulous. Oh. Thank you so much, Judge Barquette. Uh, Susan Karamanian. Of course. Hi, yeah, Susan. good to see you. Uh, and um, I'm the Dean of the College of Law at Hama bin Khalifa University in Doha. I'd like to pick up on... Um, a theme, but a, a little different aspect of it. But since you've straddled the federal courts and the state courts and and uh, international, there has been a critique of international arbitration uh, led by, in the United States, Judge Pat Higginbotham on the Fifth Circuit, uh, Lord Thomas, to a certain extent in, um, in um, the uh, United Kingdom, the former Chief Justice of England and Wales, that having disputes resolved outside of of public courts has led to a decline in the development of the law, the substantive law in, in particular. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about those observations. Thank you. Well, I don't know about that specific question, but I, I do have to say that originally in the United States, the, the, the problem is you're dealing with two different systems. And in the United States, arbitration was not looked upon very favorably by many of the judges at the time when I was there, uh, things have changed since. But one of the reasons is because unlike international, uh, uh, internet, I mean, unlike other domestic courts, which do not allow things like employer-employee relations to be arbitrated um, or consumer protection issues to be arbitrated, they don't permit them there, but in the United States, we do permit them. So we were seeing a lot of very unfair arbitrations where, um, I don't know, the, uh, uh, Carnival Cruise Lines would come in to arbitrate against the busboy. Um, so that's that was part of the problem. And I think it would be helpful to outline out some sort of guidance for when and how you know, here arbitration occurs, you know, between Shell Oil Company and the other oil company or whatever, people with equal bargaining power. And uh, that did not happen in the United States originally. Now, of course, laws have been passed because they want arbitration, but I don't think they've ever fixed that other problem. So uh, I, I think those problems need to be ironed out. I don't know how to do this. Greg, you're charged for like yeah, who's supposed to go right. next. Okay. I think the next one ought to be easy question time. I can't promise that, Judge Barquette. Lucinda oh, wow. Lowe, thank you so much for your your remarks. I, in the international arbitration world, one of the issues that has been extensively debated in recent years is the extent to which arbitrators have a duty of inquiry uh, when they perceive that there may be issues of illegality in the case. And, and one can recall the metal tech decision, for example, um, versus Uz Uzbekistan. But we've just had a decision from an English judge that you may be aware of in a case uh, versus Nigeria involving a development oil, oil and gas development project in Nigeria in which the judge was extremely critical of a very distinguished arbitral tribunal for not having looked further into issues of possible fraud or corruption in the case. And, and, and he, he, he commented on this extensively. He actually referred the lawyers for the claimant for disciplinary proceedings. Uh, but he also commented that in, in cases in which states are involved, there's an especial duty of the, of, of, of arbitrators to inquire into these issues. I wonder if you might comment. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think as I said in my comments, I, I think permitting fraud or fraudulent or, or, or uh, uh, evidence to be submitted is something that absolutely should be called out and there should be some sanctions imposed. And I, I know there are lots and lots, not lots and lots, but there's 
many opinions which will say, okay, this was fraud, this was fraud, but then nothing is done. Um, I, I think we need to think about and talk about and debate what should be done. I think there are lots of possibilities. You could dismiss the case if it's bad enough. You could, yes, you could, if, if there is an, an entity in the, in the, in the domestic um, court where that lawyer practices, you can refer them, I suppose. I think we need to do a lot more. I'm not sure of exactly what can be done, but I know something should be done and we should debate the options that are available and there should be consensus about what, uh, what, what should be done. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a program put upon judges who call out, uh, false or fraudulent uh, submissions, for one thing, and, uh, and, and more ought to be done up in, in that particular area. I mean, you cannot, have a, you cannot have a dispute resolution system which says, oh, by the way, this, this side presented false information, that was bad, and then that's it, I don't think. But, and so I think that it would be a subject of debate. There has to be some sanction that everybody in arbitration can agree on for crying in the sink. It's an old expression for those. Daniel, would you mind if we just turn to our colleague in the front row here first, and then we'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you. Hello, Judge Barquette. You've been an ad hoc judge on international tribunal. There's been a lot of criticism of ad hoc judges being an additional advocate for the side that nominates them or appoints them. What do you think? Well, first of all, I've only been an ad hoc judge in one case. You should ask Charlie about <laughs> that question. But um, I, I, I think it's no different than a party appointing an arbitrator in a, in a regular arbitration where that person uh, has an obligation to look at the, at the arguments being made by the party that appointed him, but look equally at the, at the arguments on the other side and then resolve them in a way that uh, is consistent with the law and the facts without showing favor to one or the other. And the way you can tell is what they say in their opinions. If the opinion lays out all the reasons they disagree or agree with the other side or with the majority of the court, then you, you, you can make a judgment on whether that particular person was being an advocate or being a judge. I mean, just because you rule in favor of the party that appointed you on an issue doesn't mean you're being f favored. I mean, you're not favoring that party. It just may mean that that's what the law required in their opinion, and their opinion should say that that's uh, explain the, the syllogistic reasons by which they came to their conclusion. Thanks. Uh, Daniel Mandel, as a former Florida resident, I'm sorry you're no longer there on the bench. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, but as a as a former I'm not there either. <laughs> yeah, former resident, uh, as a former and current law clerk, though I take to heart what you were just saying about the importance of uh, you know judges and arbitrators saying what it is that they're doing. I wonder. How can you enforce that without any type of oversight mechanism, right? Especially here in the U.S., where judges can or cannot do whatever they choose to do. Uh, and then, with respect to the cases uh, and the decisions, one of the judges I've clerked for has said, you know, you can tell the outcome by if the judge came to it with the answer or came to it with the question. And I'm curious about your experience. I'm not sure I understood that last remark. You can tell you can tell the outcome of a case and the reasoning by whether the judge or the the decider came to the case with the answer in mind already or came to it with a question. And I was just wondering, do you see any difference between arbitrators and judges in how they approach cases? and well, how do you deal with colleagues on panels if they come to a specific case? with an answer already in mind? I take them out for a drink first. And then, <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, the, the thing is that there are some, 
there are some philosophies that a judge has that is going to dictate the contours of how they're going to start looking at a case. For example, and I apologize to the whole international because this is, I'm doing this in terms of, of U.S. law. If you look at a case, a constitutional question, you can start by, if you believe that individual rights are preeminent, you start with individual rights and then you look at what whether or not the government could or should have curtailed them and to what degree. On the other hand, you have other the others with a judicial philosophy that say, we think that everything should be looked at that, that, from the perspective of the government having the authority to do everything uh, for the common good. And you start with that and see, uh, you know, like what was the big deal in terms of infringing on, on individual rights. So if you, if you have judges with frameworks, you do know something, but that's not to say that that judge on either side of the fence is going to automatically rule that way because they're going to look, it's true they may look through the filter of that philosophy, but then they have to deal with uh, prior law, they have to deal with precedent, they have to explain the precedent and why it's not applicable, or if it's applicable, they they say, well, this is what the law is, I, I think it shouldn't be this way, or I think Congress should do something, or or whatever. But the explanation is is there, and it isn't going to be always a situation where if you say, well, if Barquette is on the panel, it's going to be this result. If so-and-so is on the panel, it's going to be this result. I, I don't think that that is true in every single case. I think there will be a, a, a perspective, be, because you've got a record. You, you have thousands of cases that you've written, I mean, I said that the Supreme Court only is deciding maybe 60 cases a year, conversely to judges on the inter on, on the appellate courts, which are deciding three, four, and 500 cases a year. 500 cases a year. So um, uh, th th there is a track record that you can sort of follow in a particular area of the law. In arbitration, you've got an arbitrator who... I mean, I, I don't think you have that kind of of record, as it were, because issues may be different. So I don't think it's the same. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Judge Barquette. Raja Kasha, Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, uh, Justice for Atrocities Clinic. I have a related question, actually. Um, in your lecture, you talked about uh, some judges maybe, um, or, you know, sort of there's a, a, a divide. Perhaps judges make a decision based purely on the text of the law, and then perhaps judges make a decision based on other factors, socioeconomic or political or policy, the implications of the ruling that, uh, if it were based purely on the law. Uh, and you said that judges have to explain what they're doing. That seems like a necessary condition, but uh, is it sufficient? That's what I'm wondering. And I think certainly here in this country, there's a lot of debate about, uh, particularly about the Supreme Court and sort of the contours, or maybe uh, to borrow a term from the European Court of Human Rights, what is the margin of appreciation for, uh, what is the sort of reasonable boundary for uh, when a judge ceases to become sort of fulfilling the judicial function versus maybe more of a legislative okay, well that, function. That was the whole topic of David Karen's lecture here a few years ago, the 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 extent of the judicial role and what should it be. Uh, I, I I'm my, my position here today was not that, but that we have to know what position the judge is taking. And too often we don't know. Uh, that sometimes both judges and arbitrators are making decisions without really examining their own reasons. And I think, you know, you, you do it too. You have a gut reaction. You want to say, well, this is the way it should be, but you have to force yourself, I think. And I, I'm not saying I do it every time. I'm sure you can find opinions of mine where, I, you know, maybe the, ex I, nah, there aren't any, but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, you know, it, I, all I'm urging is that people who sit as decision makers, whether in a court 
or in an arbitration do a much better job of examining their, um, you know, of examining their reasons. I have heard, I, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years over a million different courts. So you can't, uh, you, you can't say is it this court or that court or the other court, but I have heard judges say, well, it's my gut feeling. And I, like, what, what is your gut feeling based on? How can you say that when the Supreme Court has said this, this, and this? Well, we just agree to disagree. Well, that's just not enough, I don't think. But uh, so that's what I'm urging. I'm urging everybody to recognize that sometimes you want to say, well, it, it just doesn't seem right not to do this. Well, that, you have to try to articulate reasons, and sometimes it's hard. That's my only little thing today here. Judge Barkat, uh, Susan Frank, longtime fan. Uh, also, can you hear me, Judge? Yeah. Okay, great. This is I love you in action because you're so personable, and you also demonstrate such humanity when you speak and in the decisions that you make. But I'd like to kind of ask you one question that was related to your talk, and then ask and follow up also on that very last question. The first element is, should we have some kind of a rules committee, such as the federal civil procedure rules have, to rethink the civil procedure rules in some kind of transnational forum? Because you were talking about we need to reevaluate the rules. So I'd be interested in your brainstorming on that topic that was directly related but to your talk. But I want to push you a little bit on the... This is my gut. So given that I work a lot with thinking about how human psychology and cognition errors that are reliable but irrational impact decision making, I'm very curious about your thoughts about the, the research by Lee Epstein. She's done a Lee Epstein. She's a scholar. She's been at Washington University. She's been at uh, U University of Southern California. She's been really interested in how Supreme Court justices in the United States make decisions. And so she's actually gone to places like Justice Powell's papers and looked to see the history of the decision-making process that have been written out in notes and diary notations. And part of her empirical research has shown that even on the U.S. Supreme Court prior to the shadow docket, there was a lot of negotiated decision-making that was quite clear and never put in the public domain. And my thought is this is human as opposed to well, superhuman. But then how do you deal with that? If you're flushing out your assumptions, what's the cost to the judicial system in being that transparent? You know, that, that's why we have judges and not machines. And I will concede that it is difficult for three people or seven people or nine people to try to work out um, the solution to a case. And they will consider other other judges' considerations, which may be socioeconomic, which may be a uh, human rights perspective, which may be something something else. Um, and and there are <laughs> there there are um, times when you do say, "Is it better to?" Uh, well, let me th think of an example. An example is in the. In the uh, courts of appeal, sometimes you'll get per curiam orders, which are in our, which were in our court not binding. So the question is, should I agree to make this per curiam because I don't want this to be the law, or should I say we should publish this because you're making law and the public should see what you guys think? And so you're you're constantly you're constantly dealing with these issues in, in and and we're human beings as i said so you're considering a lot of things i'm pushing for myself and others to be very to try to be very clear in trying to say some things but sometimes you don't or you feel you can't it's not a you know it's not a perfect system that's the other thing i if i if i were to do nothing more in life than to try to explain to people that every single thing that we do is complicated. Decisions are complicated. And I, I'm not sure you can clearly explain every single time why you're doing <coughs> why you're doing what you're doing. But you have to try your best. 
And that's what I think all judges can do. But I, but I think we have to acknowledge that we're not perfect. And there, there is this give and take when you're trying to come to a communal decision by an appellate court of whatever kind or a, or a tribunal. All right, we only have six more minutes. So if we could go really briefly with a question, maybe um, we'll really briefly and then we'll see how we go. Okay. I'll be brief in the answer yeah. too. Hi, Judge Bhak uh, Bhakted. Um, my name is Pushkar. I'm from uh, Georgetown Law, but originally from um, India. Uh, my question draws from one of the sharp criticism against arbitration about uh, how there is a lack of development of substantive law, uh, more so in ISDS landscape. I'm sorry, the lack of... Uh, development of substantive law. Substantive law. Uh, I think that was one of the questions previously asked as well. Uh, but my question is most mostly on the lines of dissenting opinions, because some of the uh, dissenting opinions in international arbitrations do not really see the end of the day by becoming the actual law. Or, but in the national courts, uh, we see some of the dissenting opinions actually becoming the law of the land many decades later. So I just wonder if you have an opinion on why international arbitrators should not write more dissenting opinions. Uh, I'm not sure I understood totally the questions, but I do think there is a function for dissenting opinions, explaining why they believe that the majority opinion is wrong or the other judges' opinions is wrong, so long as they explain their dissenting opinions. I think it has a function, and, uh, and, and I think it's important. Now, you don't want to dissent in every single case, you want to try to be judicious about if it's something that doesn't particularly matter because there, it's also, this is all so complicated because there is your position on the court. You want, which doesn't, I don't think, appear so much in, in like commercial arbitration, but you are working with these seven or nine people all the time. So uh, if you're nitpicking with them because one little difference of opinion on, on every single case and your your credibility down the road is going to be not as strong as somebody who makes a suggestion without writing a dissent about it uh, to fix whatever they're complaining about but it is complicated thank you it's not a Joan Donahue judge Donahue. oh come on Joan <laughs> come on <laughs> sorry um, and, and, and somebody want attribution? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll leave that. I'll leave that to people's imagination. So I um, come from a background of spending 14 years being the only American on a court, and um, because of the way that ICJ judges are chosen, normally you'll have somewhere between four and six of them coming from the common law tradition. Almost everyone else coming from the civil law tradition. I just wanted to mention that because. If this conversation were taking place at the European Society of International Law, the questions and comments would be quite different because uh, civil, those trained in the civil law would have a very different idea about the importance of setting out their reasons, the relevance of their gut versus something else. And um, it's one of the many fascinating aspects of the influences of these two, of these two traditions that I have kind of enjoyed being part of at the International Court of Justice. Uh, and some of them, if they were here, would probably uh, take the floor and say that on the common law side, the judges are doing the same thing in their heads. They're acting on their gut, and then they're developing a set of reasoning that aligns with that. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to kind of bring that into the conversation because I think it's quite a different perspective than we hear in, a, in an audience that is largely, although not exclusively, those of us coming from the United States. Right. And there are a lot of unspoken things like the belief that you might be acting out of uh, favoritism rather than the way you see the law. There are a lot of, uh, yeah. And, and the way common law from civil law people approach the problem, it, it starts off being different. Yes. I, I don't know what more I can <laughs> say, but I, yes, thank you. Come up here and do the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, please. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Barquette. Uh, I'm Guillermo Garcia Sanchez from Texas A&M University School of Law. Uh, my question is regarding one of the proposals for amendment of the investment regime is to create an appeal court that has permanent uh, arbitrators reviewing the work of lower, well, <laughs> big lower court arbitrators. I would love to hear your thoughts about whether that could be a solution to the to the problems that you raise, especially in international investment arbitration. 
Rosemary, do you want to go behind the microphone? Here. So I'll give you one more uh, war story about judges on the 11th Circuit. There were two judges, Judge Brown and I forget, Judge Wisdom maybe on the other side. And there was an oral argument <clears throat> and the lawyer made was making his argument and Judge Wisdom interrupted him and said, well, what about this? And the lawyer was stuttering and stammering, couldn't answer it. And so then Judge Brown jumped in and said, well, counsel, isn't the answer this, this, and this? And the lawyer said, yes, yes, that's the answer. <laughs> and so a couple more minutes, then Judge Wisdom asked another question. The lawyer floundered again. Judge Wisdom came, I mean, Judge Brown came to his rescue and said, well, are you saying this, this, or this? And uh, the lawyer said, yes, you're right, Judge Brown. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> And so the third time it happened, Judge Wisdom stopped the lawyer and said, well, what about this case or that case or the other case? And the lawyer, but nothing was forthcoming from Judge Wisdom. So the lawyer looks at Judge Wisdom and says, Judge Wisdom, what do we think about that? <laughs> and now I want to say to Joan Donahue, Joan, what do you think about this question? And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rosemary, for everything you've done for law, for everything you're doing now for international law and arbitration, for this magnificent uh, lecture where we're just giving us so much to think about. And we have lots of follow-up questions, but we know you need to go. But just again, just one last thank you. 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 Thank you.